Next up, please give it up for Benjamin Lightburn, Filament Health. It's weird to be in, uh, back up on a stage after all these years. So anyways, hope you'll bear with me as I swallow my butterflies. Um, I'm Ben Lightburn. I'm CEO and co-founder of Filament Health. Um, you may have heard of us. We're, we do things a little differently at Filament. Um, we do psychedelic medicines naturally. My background and the background of the founding team is actually all 100% dedicated to manufacturing botanical extracts for a variety of different industries. Um, these kinds of substances are used in the dietary supplement industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, in the cosmetics industry, in the food ingredients industry. Um, and working in that, those industries for many years, um, and also seeing the rise of the psychedelics industry, sort of struck us as a little bit curious that all attention and resources, or at least the vast majority, were going to synthetically prepared psychedelic substances. And, and while there's nothing wrong with manufacturing psychedelics synthetically, in fact, synthetic psychedelics are good. They're, they're safe and they're effective as, as shown in clinical trials. We think that synthetic leaves a little bit to be desired and that natural will be the preferred option for many. Um, when you make a psychedelic substance through a process of chemical synthesis, you're really only making the primary metabolite. In the case of magic mushrooms, you're really only making psilocybin, but we know that magic mushrooms contain much more than just psilocybin. Uh, in addition, we know that consumers prefer natural products in all aspects of their life. We like to glibly say that no one takes synthetic caffeine uh, in the morning. They all prefer coffee. We think the same thing is going to be true uh, for the psychedelics industry in the future. We all here in this room agree, and we all know that the mental health crisis is something that's facing society. It's one of our most pressing challenges. Uh, recent global events, we don't have to repeat them, but they're certainly not doing anything to help alleviate the current situation. Um, we know that current treatments are ineffective and that we need new options. And we at Filament believe that we need to look to nature for those options. Because as it turns out, over 40% of all drugs that get approved have some kind of natural or botanical origin. This is a surprising fact to most people. Most people think that, well, pharmaceutical must mean synthetic, and naturals can't be pharmaceuticals. But actually, nothing could be further from the truth. The largest selling cancer drug of all time was actually a natural extract from the inner bark of the Pacific yew tree. It's a compound called paclitaxel. We think just as, just as equally that this will apply to the psychedelics industry as well. We think that nature is the place where not only were these medicines discovered, but also it's where we will discover the next medicines. Either in combination with all the different metabolites that you extract from the natural plant species, the example of psilocybin I mentioned earlier, when we extract from magic mushrooms, we don't extract just psilocybin, we extract psilocin, baocystin, norbaocystin, a dozen other compounds. Or these other compounds might have efficacy in isolation, such as I'll get into psilocin, a compound that we've extracted from the ma magic mushroom and standardized and got into a human deliverable form for the first time. So the, dr the drug candidates that we started with are all extracts from the magic mushroom. Um, it's important to note that these are in fact botanical drug candidates. So what does that, what does that mean, a botanical drug? A botanical drug is a drug that's extracted from a natural source, but that contains all of the secondary metabolites, all the other active metabolites besides the primary metabolite, as if they were present naturally in the raw species. Okay, so an, for example, an isolated psilocybin extracted naturally, that's, that's not considered a botanical drug. Our first can is called PEX-010. It's standardized to give a 25 milligram dose of oral psilocybin but also to contain the secondary metabolites in the same ratio as if you were to consume a magic mushroom. PEX-020 and PEX-030 are candidates that are standardized to deliver a stable and consistent dose of psilocin. Orally in the case of PEX-020 and in fact sublingually in the case of PEX-030. And I'll get into why psilocin is important uh, in, in following slides. Um, rounding out some other candidates that we have in preclinical development, we're working on some products based on the traditional ayahuasca brew, which as we know is already given out as an extract, but what's missing is standardization and stabilization in order to deliver it repeatedly so that we can get good clinical evidence for its efficacy. Psilocin, um, as most of the people in this room know, 
is the active form of psilocybin. Psilocybin needs to convert into psilocin before it be, can become bioactive or have hallucinogenic or therapeutic effects. But because psilocin is unstable, especially when manufactured synthetically, up till now, all research has been on synthetically prepared psilocybin. But because we, again, manufacture things naturally, when we first made our extracts, we saw the psilocybin, we saw the psilocin, both are present in the magic mushroom. And knowing that psilocin was the active form of psilocybin, we thought, well, wouldn't psilocin make a better drug candidate? Why? Well, you can imagine, because we don't have to wait for the conversion from psilocybin to psilocin to take place, we might have a faster onset time. We might have fewer gastrointestinal side effects because this conversion is thought to take place in the gut. But what we're most excited to try to achieve is more consistent dosing. It's important to note that the therapeutic and hallucinogenic effects of psilocybin and psilocin are actually due to the blood plasma levels of psilocin, not to the oral dose of psilocybin. And we see, based on various preclinical studies that have been, and clinical and preclinical and clinical studies that have been done, that the hallucinogenic response is actually much more cl closely correlated to that blood plasma of psilocin, not to the oral dose of psilocybin. So it's our hypothesis that by delivering psilocin directly, we can get a much more consistent and stable dose and a much more consistent therapeutic response. I should note that the PEX010, PEX020, and PEX030, so the oral psilocybin, oral psilocin, and sublingual psilocin, all three of those have been approved by the FDA to enter into a phase one human clinical trial taking place at the University of California, San Francisco. This trial marks the first time that the FDA has approved a naturally sourced psychedelic substance to enter into a human clinical trial, and also the first time that the FDA has approved the direct administration of psilocin, in our case, both orally and sublingually. Uh, this trial is expected to begin dosing in the next uh, few weeks, just got to get all the paperwork in order to ship the controlled substances across the border. Um, in addition to our own clinical pipeline, um, we're proud to partner with a growing list of partners uh, that conduct uh, clinical trials, licensing our drug candidates for use in their own clinical trials. Typically, these are groups that have a uh, speciality in a certain indication. In the case of uh, Entheotech Biosyn Biosciences, for example, they're specialists in opioid tapering and are getting clinical trials set up to address their own particular indication. Uh, in many cases, these relationships, these relationships actually generate revenue for us. And it's a really interesting business model and it's all uh, predicated on the fact that our candidates enjoy a significant amount of IP protection. The IP that we enjoy falls into a couple of different categories. There is the trade secret and the know-how associated with the growing of the raw materials. In the case of our magic mushroom products, we actually grow the mushrooms in-house. So things like the growing conditions, the substrate, the harvesting time, all of that forms a, a kind of know-how uh, internal IP. But then when we move on to the actual manufacturing technologies, the extraction technology, the purification technology, standardization and stabilization. Many of these compounds are known to be unstable. And so we've been developing innovative processes which for the first time allow for stabilized, standardized, pharmaceutical grade clinical trial candidates of magic mushrooms and other psychoactive species. Um, we have now a total of three issued patents in the US and Canada covering extraction technology, and we expect to have many more issued patents uh, in the near future. And I think this speaks to the fact that we're working in a field where not much progress has been made over many, many decades. Skip that one, skip that one. Um, you guys are bored already, I can tell. Um, one thing we like to talk about is the idea that we see non-pharmaceutical markets arriving in places like Oregon State, uh, in places like California perhaps, Colorado, um, it's clear that there will be a kind of non-pharmaceutical component to the psychedelics market. How big of a component that is, I don't think anybody knows. I think we wish we all would know, um, but I think we can all agree that it will be there. And what we can also probably agree on is in these non-pharmaceutical markets that 
probably natural products will be preferred. So while we think we have a very attractive offering and business model for pharmaceutical development and through our licensing opportunities, we think that in any of these non-pharmaceutical markets that develop, we think that natural products will be uh, much preferred and it will be um, very receptive to our technology, which will be able to provide standardized, stabilized, consistent doses of psychedelic substances. Our facility, we're, we're based in Vancouver, BC. Um, that's a picture, we, act, we don't own the whole building, we just have one unit in that building. Um, doesn't prevent us from showing a picture of the whole building. Um, 3,500 square feet, like I said, we grow the magic mushrooms. We have a pilot scale manufacturing facility. Uh, it's GMP compliant, um, audited. We uh, have a capacity to produce roughly 2,000 high doses of psilocybin per month in this small facility. The question of scale is when we get a lot for, um, for our net, well, you can't scale up a natural process. Well, actually you can. Um, and in, even in a small facility like the one we have now, we're able to produce a very, fairly significant quantity of psilocybin. The fact that we have all of this in-house, we don't rely on manufacturing partners, it allows us to develop IP much quicker and allows us to uh, basically have good customer service for all of our licensing partners, both in terms of the actual substances, but also in terms of the regulatory knowledge that getting natural psychedelic clinical trials up and running requires. The, the people on the top row uh, of, our, of our team slide, we all worked together at a previous company called Mott's Innovation. This was a company that, uh, a, a Vancouver-based startup that actually we exited in the summer of 2018. Um, and really, I like to say we're like the Rolling Stones circa 2005. We got the old band back together again um, uh, to try our hand at making um, these psychoactive alkaloids from these psychedelic, uh, making these psychedelic clinical trials from these psychoactive alkaloids. Um, board of directors, um, they're really good blue chip kind of people. Um, you're bored of all this stuff anyway. So uh, we're, we're publicly traded, uh, as is the fashion amongst um, uh, psychedelic companies. We're traded in Canada on the NEO exchange and uh, down here in the United States on the OTCQB. Um, we'll be around if anyone wants to come and, uh, and chat. We have a booth out there, booth number M2. And uh, with that, I well, you definitely don't want to read that. Um, uh, thank you for your time, and I think we have time for we questions. We have time for questions. Great. Does anybody have a question for Benjamin Lightburn? Let's give him a round of applause first and foremost. Thank you so much. Straight from the editorial team at Benzinga, really quickly, natural medicinal products are hard to get approved because of how hard it is to reach consistency between batches. Is that a problem for filament? How have you tackled that? So hard to get approved. Um, I would point out that uh, no psychedelic substance has been approved, at least in at, at least in North America. Um, and while I think it's obviously very fair to say that uh, synthetic products are further along down the path of approval, we don't actually know whether it's going to be harder to get a, a natural product approved. Although I will grant that it is more difficult to achieve standardization and stabilization with a natural product. Um, in the case of our product, essentially we don't have, we need to standardize not just psilocybin, but also all of the other secondary metabolites. So it is more work, um, but that's where expertise in manufacturing these kinds of botanical products does come into play. Um, and so it's a problem that we've been able to uh, overcome, even with un notoriously unstable compound like psilocin. So it's really our, our it, a lot of the core of our secret technology is in how we overcame that challenge, but the fact that our products are now in uh, clinical trials means that the regulatory authorities did review all of our stability and consistency and deemed it safe to proceed, so. Wonderful answer. Any questions from the audience before we ask one more? Yes, we have one right here in the middle, Aaron or Aaron. We have two Aarons here, Penzinga. Wonderful, you get to state your name and then the question, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I probably didn't even need this microphone for anyone that knows me. Maxwell from Across International. So we do material processing, lab equipment, and like laboratory extraction solutions. Yep. So I wanted to ask, like from the perspective of someone that is doing extractions and formulations of naturally derived substances, like where do you feel like there are like dearths or opportunities where like 
you would like some sort of like technological solution or laboratory solution, like whether it be creating nano emulsions or whether it be processing a particularly difficult material, like where do you guys see those challenges as kind of a vertically integrated solution developer? I think the, the physical challenges are quite different depending on each thing that you're extracting. Um, um, just because of the physical characteristics of each plant or mushroom species that you're extracting. So it, it would vary quite a bit. Um, we try to use as uh, kind of broadly applicable equipment so that we can obviously don't have to switch out entire lines of equipment when we're extracting from one thing uh, one day to the next. Um, what equipment do we need? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, most of the process is, is, is pretty well dialed, but I'm, I'd be happy to continue this conversation uh, at our booth if you want. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I was just mostly asking if, like, the whole industry perspective. And thank you. Awesome. Any other questions from the audience at this time for Filament Health and Benjamin Lightburn? Uh, one more question from Benzinga. We just spent a presentation on this, so as quick summation, um, what are your basic arguments for choosing botanical psychedelics over synthetic ones? Well, I would say that um, the consumption of natural psychedelics um, has way more evidence um, uh, in favor of uh, safety um, and not efficacy in the traditional sense, but sort of we could say some kind of effect. Um, consider that you know many millions of doses of natural psychedelics have been given, um, whereas maybe only a few thousand doses of uh, of, of synthetic uh, psilocybin has been given. Um, I think that uh, consumers prefer natural products, right? Uh, in all aspects of their life, right? They not asking for more artificial blue food coloring, right? They want more natural food dye. I gave the example of uh, of, of caffeine earlier. Um, how that pertains to the eventual consumer market for psychedelics, we don't know. Um, we don't know how many people will prefer synthetic, how many people will prefer natural, um, but I think it's fair to say that there is some percentage of the people that will always prefer a natural or like greatly prefer, and so really what we wanna be able to provide is a, is a choice so that people have the opportunity to choose. Love that. Benjamin Lightburn, everybody.